Hi, good morning everybody. Um, today we're going to uh, continue talking about partition functions and uh, hopefully get a little bit more uh, familiar with what this means and how we write them down and we'll do a few specific examples. Then next time on, on Monday, we're going to talk about issues like what happens when your system of particles interacts. And um, let's see if I can get my mic to not make that noise. Maybe not. Okay, so, all right, so the last couple of lectures, we'll learn about what happens when our system of particles interacts. And then um, Wednesday next week, the lecture will be given by your TA, John Mark, who is going to uh, go over some examples of partition functions. Um, I think it'll be really great. It's, uh, it's his lecture debut. Um, I will be in Washington, D.C. reviewing NIH proposals. So, um, you know, PCHEM is an important part of my job, but it's about a third of the job. So the rest of it is uh, managing a research group and reviewing things like proposals and stuff like that. So how that works, how people get NIH grants is um, you know, everybody submits proposals and then uh, reviewers who are other professors review these things and look at, at factors like is there a well laid out plan? You know, are there benchmarks for success? If it succeeds, is it likely to do something important? And then everybody has to go to Washington, D.C. and sit around and discuss these things and give them scores. So that is what I will be doing next week on Wednesday. So that also means that office hours next week are canceled because I'll be traveling Tuesday and Thursday. Wednesday I'll be in D.C. So um, please use the Facebook page if you have questions. Uh, I'll be checking that relatively regularly. Your TAs will be checking it also. And I will have office hours during finals week. So our exam is Friday, so there's plenty of time to prepare. Um, I don't know exactly when yet, but I'll be posting those later on. But I'll definitely have a bunch of office hours during finals week, so there will be plenty of time to ask questions. Um, anybody have any questions for me about stuff before we continue talking about StatMac? Okay, let's do it. All right, so last time we ended up talking about the rotational spectrum of HCl and how we get the intensities of, of different peaks. And we looked at the relative populations between the ground state and the first excited state in this rotational spectrum. And so we looked at, uh, you know, the fact that these, this relative population just depends on the degeneracy of the states and the energy between them, and a parameter that's really fundamental to this is the temperature. And so that's something that we're going to keep coming back to in StatMech. The internal energy that's distributed tells us about which states are accessible, and the parameter that's really fundamental to that is temperature. In some ways, what's the really fundamental quantity is beta, 1 over kT. Okay, so, so we saw a specific example of how we get these populations, and we're going to come back to rotational spectra. But let's look at how we write down the partition function in a more general way. So we can write down our population of some state I in a relative sense, so relative to the total number of molecules in the system. And that depends on this uh, parameter beta, which again is uh, 1 over kT. So we've got e to the minus beta times the energy of the system. And then that's divided by the partition function. Q. And the partition function tells us about how much energy is in different modes of the system. So what do I mean by different modes? It depends on context. It could be, we could be talking about different vibrational modes or rotational modes or 
translation of the molecule bouncing around in a container. All of these things could possibly be contained within the partition function, electronic states too, for that matter. Most of the time, we try to treat all of these things separately if it's possible, just because it's a pain to have to deal with all of these variables simultaneously, and usually they don't interact with each other. So we try to separate them when we can. So in the, in the previous example, we were just talking about the rotational states. And we wrote down, you know, sort of justified in a hand wavy way, the relative population between two states. But now here's the real definition of the, the partition function. OK, so we sum up over all the states the degeneracies. And then we have e to the minus beta times the energy of each state. And we sum that up over all the states. So again, how is, that, how is all the states defined? Well, for something like an NMR system, that's really easy. If we have a spin 1 half, it's a two-level system. There's only two of them. There are you know, other things that act like two-level systems, particularly if we're talking about electronic spectroscopy a lot of times you'll only have really low level excited states available and there's a well-defined number of them. So in that case, we can make that kind of approximation. For things like vibrational and rotational states, we might have to take something that looks like an infinite series to, to sum over all the states. So what you actually do here depends a lot on context and the particular mathematics of the, the situation we have. OK, so that's how we express the partition function in a general sense. And again, what this is telling us is it's something about how the energy is distributed among different states. And more specifically, it's telling us something about how many states are accessible to the system at a given temperature. All right, so let's go back to our rotational spectrum of HCl and write an expression for its rotational partition function. OK, so we need the energies of all of the rotational states and their degeneracies. And I, I realize my title of this slide is a little bit ill-chosen, because that's, of course, an IR spectrum of HCl. But we get the rotational energy levels from it. So the, uh, the idea is there, just the terminology isn't the best. OK, so we have uh, the energy level. The energy of some level j is hc beta times j times j plus 1. And remember, in the, uh, the context of the partition function, we wanted to find the ground state to have zero energy, just because it makes the math easier. So we know that there's some zero point energy. It's not actually zero. but we define it that way in this context. We also know that the degeneracy of each level is 2j plus 1. And so here's the expression for the partition function. So there's not really an upper limit on the number of rotational states. You can just put more and more energy into the system, and the molecule will rotate faster and faster. And as we go up in energy, the states look closer and closer together. It becomes more like a continuum. But there's not really an upper limit. So we have to, to sum over all these levels from 0 to infinity. And then we plug in the expressions for the degeneracy of the states and for their energies, which we, we know from having looked at this previously. And that can be evaluated numerically pretty straightforwardly using the experimental energies. So in other words, you can count the peaks in the spectrum and you know, see how many you can realistically see and plug in all the energies for these things and calculate a value for the partition function. And you'll get, you'll get a number. I want to just mention something here, which is going to come up again in our example day. And that is, if you try to do this with rotational Raman, you know, rather than a pure uh, rotational spectrum, 
we end up with, you know, you might count too many states because in, in rotational Raman, you get the same uh, configuration of the molecule twice every, during every rotation. So again, just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll see that more during the uh, example day. Okay, so when we go to evaluate this, we can look up the rotational constant for HCl, and it's about 10.6 wave numbers. And we can plug that into our expressions for the energy. And if we take the sum of the first 10 terms, so we're looking at the first 10 states in the rotational energy, let's see what we get for the partition function. And if you count the peaks in that spectrum, you can see that we have not very, not very many more than 10. So of course, that's, uh, those are giving your transitions rather than the states. But in other words, this approximation is not perfect, but you know, we're, we're seeing most of the, the states that are populated if we take the first 10 terms. OK, so I got these numbers out of your book. It is really straightforward to, to calculate them. You're just, you're just plugging in the energies of the different states. So if we evaluate this quantity that we're summing over, for each of these states, here's what we get. So we already did this. We saw that the, the relative population of the first excited state to the ground state is about 2.71. And we know that that's because of the degeneracy. There are more ways to be in that first excited state. And then similarly, as we get up to the second excited state, we have even more ways to do that. And at this temperature, which is uh, 298 Kelvin, the degeneracy is still dominating. Same thing as we go up to J equals 3. There are, there's still more population in that state. And then that starts to level off as we get up to J equals 4. And so at this point, it should be really clear why the relative intensities of the lines in the spectrum look the way they do. So remember, in the, in, in the spectrum, we're looking at the transitions between one state and another. So we can't just map the, the, the uh, heights of the intensities onto the populations of a particular state. But it does tell us something about, about what's populated. And OK, so we saw that this starts to turn over at about j equals 4. And the numbers, uh, the, the relative populations start going down again. And then as we get up to j equals 10, we get something that looks like 0 0.08. OK, so if we add this up, the sum of the, the first 50 terms is uh, about 19.902. It was 19.90 for the, the first 10 terms. So we can see that, that uh, there's really not more, more than about 10 states populated in this system at room temperature. Adding another 40 of them doesn't really do you much good. Of course, this is going to change if we change the temperature. So if we cool the system down significantly, what's going to happen is we're going to get a tighter distribution. So there will be more, you know, more population in the most populated states, and things won't be as spread out. And also, the, maximum, the maximally populated state will move to being lower. If we heat the system up, then we're going to get something that's, that's much flatter. It's much closer to all of the states being equally populated. OK, so this also leads us to an approximation that we can use for these kind of things, which is that the rotational partition function approximately equals kT over hc beta. And yesterday, when we were looking at this uh, spectrum, this, this quantity was, was just kind of stuck up there. That's why. It's, uh, it's a reasonable approximation to the, uh, the rotational partition function. And if you do that, you get 19.6 in this case. So it's not perfect, but 
it does give you something that's in the right ballpark and it isn't very much work. Yes. It's, it's related to the population. But so this is, this is uh, you know, this quantity that we're adding up in the, uh, in the partition function. So it's, it's a relative, it's essentially a relative population, relative to how many are in the ground state. E sub i equals e to the negative theta epsilon. In the denominator, you have the. That's right. You have to. Well. You, so, you, so to get the, uh, the, po the actual population of the state, you have to divide by the partition function, which is telling you something about the overall population. So we're going to see some more examples later. OK, so what this, telling, what this is telling us is how many states are thermally accessible at a particular temperature. And so let's just think about some limiting cases to try to get a sense of this. So let's say the temperature is close to 0. We cool our system almost all the way down to zero Kelvin. There's not very much motion going on. And you know, here beta is 1 over kT, and that starts to approach infinity as temperature is close to zero. And so what that tells us is that everything other than the first term in the sum is going to equal zero. So they're all equal to e to the minus x with x equals infinity, except for the first one. And that gives us something that's really intuitive. If we really cool the system down to where it's close to zero, almost everything is going to be in the ground state level. And so um, I should point out that a lot of people who are really looking at this from a a theoretical physics perspective or you know, even from some other systems that, uh, that behave this way in things other than statistical mechanics, a lot of people would say that beta is really the fundamental parameter rather than temperature. Because if we think about our standard understanding of how this relates to temperature, which is that as we put, you know, as we have higher temperature, that means that we have more entropy, more motion, things moving around, our standard understanding of that means that we can't have a negative temperature. That's, that seems to be impossible from our intuitive understanding of how molecules work. So we have some zero point energy, things are cooled down to absolute zero, and nothing is moving. And that's because we're thinking about this in terms of a particular type of physical system, that being molecules that are moving around. In other sorts of things, we can have negative temperature. And it's kind of a, a bizarre concept. So something that has a negative temperature, you know, you might think it's really, really cold. It's not. It's really hot. So let's think about a system that we have talked about that has a negative temperature. So if we think about our NMR system, where we have at equilibrium, we have uh, spins in the alpha and beta states, and there's a little bit of an excess of the alpha state. And then we go to do an inversion recovery experiment. We give 180 degree pulse. So we have our magnetization vector, where there are more spins in the alpha than beta state. And then we give 180 degree pulse, and now we have a population inversion. So now there are more spins in the beta state than the alpha state. During the time that the system is like that, before it relaxes back to equilibrium, it has a negative temperature. There's more, there are more spins in the higher energy state than in the lower energy state. And um, that was uh, one of the main reasons, I think, why um, Purcell got the Nobel Prize for you know, the discovery of some of these NMR phenomena, because physically, that's a really weird setup to be able to put a system in. Recently, some physicists were able to generate a, a system with negative temperature in terms of actual molecules. We'll, we'll talk about that more later. But when you think about these, these kind of, of issues and how we can have something where putting more energy 
into the system reduces the entropy, then negative temperature is possible. And that's one reason why you might want to think about beta as being the fundamental parameter in a thermodynamic sense rather than the temperature itself. OK, so if we look at our NMR system, it's an easy example because it only has two levels, at least in the spin 1 half case. We have uh, our two states, alpha and beta. And as the temperature gets close to absolute 0, our partition function ends up being very close to 1 because everything is in this lower energy state, which is not degenerate. OK, so we talked about what happens at low temperature. We talked about how we can get a negative temperature. Um, let's look at what happens when the temperature is high. One misunderstanding that people have sometimes starting out with this is you might think, like, OK, when temperature is high, then you have an excess of states in the, of spins in the upper state. You don't. That's, uh, you, you know, you have, to, you have to set the system up in a particular way to get that. That's our 180 degree pulse where we end up with a negative temperature. But just heating up the system doesn't do that. It doesn't make us have more spins in the excited state. So what happens when the temperature is high is that you tend toward equal populations in the states. So you have plenty of energy. There's, no reason, there's, there's less reason why it matters if you're in the lower energy state as opposed to the higher one. And our partition function tends to, um, you know, just, you just get the solution where everything is equally distributed. So in this case, our partition function is going to go, it's going to end up being 2 as uh, our temperature goes to infinity. OK, so let's look at, at some concrete examples of how to write these things down. So this is something that you're definitely going to need to do. So I'm still, uh, I'm still working on some practice problems for, uh, for this. I'll have them up at some point today, definitely. Um, I wanted to go beyond the ones that are in your book and give some more examples uh, uh, illustrating you know, some probability ideas. So I will definitely have those up later today. But um, so one of the things that you'll need to do is be able to write down partition functions for fairly simple systems. We're going to do some practice problems where you have to use some infinite series and add up stuff for rotational and vibrational states. But you know, those are a little bit more involved. It's good to work them out to see how it works. As far as being able to do it on the exam, systems like this are more realistic. OK, so we know our relative, our expression for the population of a state i. And let's look at how we write the partition function for things that are, that are defined in terms of a small number of states. OK, so let's say we have a two-level system where the lower state is non-degenerate. So there's only one, one way to get the lower state. And the upper state is doubly degenerate. And so the first thing that you need to do to, to be able to solve such a problem is uh, you know, look at the description and words and be able to, to write an energy level diagram for that. So our lower state is non-degenerate. The upper state is doubly degenerate. And then it's important to remember that we always define the energy of our ground state as 0 in these kinds of problems. So it's completely general. It doesn't matter what kind of system it is. It doesn't matter at all. We, we define that one as 0. And we also said that uh, in this case, the energy of the first excited state, we're just going to call epsilon. And so then we can write down our partition function. 
And remember, we have this, uh, we have to stick the degeneracy in, in front of it, and then we have this Boltzmann distribution looking thing for uh, the energy of the states. And so in this particular case, we just get one plus two times e to the minus beta epsilon. So this is definitely something that you should know how to do. If you have you know, a description in words of some system that contains a small number of states with degeneracies given, you should be able to write down its partition function. OK, so let's talk about um, specific contributions to the partition function. Yes? But so, what, so, so where did the where did the equation um, g equals two j plus one come from? That was for a linear molecule, right? It's for the, it's for a rotational system of a linear of a linear molecule. Yeah. In this one, did I say it's a rotational partition function at all? No. It's just really general, right? So I just told you, the degeneracy of the bottom state is one, and the degeneracy of the upper state is two. Um, how do I know that? Who knows? Who, know, who knows what it even is? It's, it's just very, very general. So um, you know, don't, don't, get, uh, don't get excited about using the specific rules for certain things if you're not looking at that situation. Okay. It's an easy mistake to make. But, and that's why we're going to go through a few examples of different kinds of, of partition functions. But yeah, in this particular case, you know, you don't even know what it is. So, that, so how we got the degeneracy of the states is uh, is unknowable. Okay, so here is a general partition function, or at least the uh, the energies involved in it. Okay, so if we, you know, if we sum up all the energies, you know, the partition function is with respect to their exponentials. So we're we're going to multiply those all together. Um, what's, uh, what's going on here with these different uh, contributions? OK, so we're looking at all the degrees of freedom with respect to motion that our molecule can have, plus also the electronic transitions. That's not really a motion exactly, but uh, it's convenient to, to count it anyway because it's something that we often have to worry about for molecules. OK, so we have a translational component and a rotational component and a vibrational component and also an electronic one. And I mentioned this before, but it's, it's worth bringing up again because it really makes your life easier. If it is at all possible, we only want to look at one of these things at, at a time. Because usually they don't interact. And it just makes the math a lot easier if we're only adding up one set of degrees of freedom at once. Also, in context, we usually only care about one of them at once because we're looking at a particular type of spectroscopy or we're, you know, we're analyzing some experimental data in which we would be unlikely to have all of these things going on at the same time. Here's an exception. If we have a system where more than the ground electronic state is excited, so we have a lot of electronic transitions going on, of course we know from looking at uh, electronic spectroscopy that when you excite various electronic excited states, then of course all the vibrational excited the, the vibrational transitions get excited as well. So, you know, when our molecule gets promoted to an excited electronic state, that induces a bunch of vibrations. And so, if we have uh, more than the ground electronic state populated, then we can't separate those two. For most molecules that we're going to be looking at at room temperature, only the ground electronic state is, pop is populated. So, that's a pretty good approximation for most of the things that we're going to look at. And we can generally always separate, separate the translational and rotational 
United States. Okay, so another thing that's important about this general kind of partition function is that it's usually not possible to solve it analytically. So this is where Mathematica is your friend. You, you're gonna need a lot of numerical solutions. The examples that we're gonna do in class are, go are going to involve things where there's some approximation we can make. Um, if you really get into doing StatMac, you know, if you do this in grad school, one of the things you'll see is, you know, when you, when you start getting into more advanced problems, there's, you know, there's always some little trick that enables you to make some approximation. It turns out that's kind of how you solve every problem. So there's either some clever approximation that you can make or you just brute force do it with numerical methods. Okay, so now that we've seen um, how we write these things down in general and we've talked about how we want to keep them separated if we can, let's look at some specific examples. So the ones that, that I'm going through today are in your book. At least uh, if I get as far as I think I'm gonna get, there are some at the end that are not, but let's see how we do. Okay, so these are examples that you've seen before in different contexts, which is nice because you know the, the basic story. We can just talk about how, the, how it relates to the partition function. The first one we're gonna look at is the electronic states having to do with a particle in a box. So this should be really familiar from last quarter. I know that, uh, that you spent a bunch of time on this. So you know the energy levels for the um, n values of the particle in the box. And you uh, solved for these and you know what they are. The only thing that's different is, as always, we're, uh, you know, we're gonna define the, the uh, lower, we're gonna put everything in terms of the lower energy state. And so we can write, uh, if we define the, the, uh, the, one, the energy for n equals one as epsilon, we can write that epsilon for level n is n squared minus one times epsilon. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the translational partition function for our particle in the box. And so we've got n squared minus one times epsilon. We're going to approximate that as summing from zero to infinity over e to the minus n squared beta epsilon <coughs> dn. And so we're, in, we're gonna take the integral instead of the sum here because that's easier to deal with, just mathematically. And so we can rearrange just for the sake of convenience just to make it easier to do. Yes? Uh, I'm trying to remember, didn't the uh, quantum number n go from like one, two, three, it didn't have a zero state, so why does the uh, bounds on the integral zero to infinity? Yeah, hang, hang with me. See, I'm, I'm rearranging stuff so that, uh, to make it easier to do. If it doesn't, if, it does, if it's not clear by the end, we'll talk about it some more, but let's, let's go through it. Okay, so we're, Rearranging this to look at it in terms of x. So this is a one-dimensional system by definition, right? It's a, it's a particle in a one-dimensional box. And so um, we're integrating this over, over uh, with respect to x. And so if we evaluate this integral, we get an expression for our translational partition function as a function of x. And yeah, now that I'm, now that I'm looking at this, I think that uh, 
the answer to Corey's question is I shouldn't have skipped so many steps in the beginning. So I should have written up a sum, you know, from n equals one to infinity, and then showed that we're transferring this to an integral in terms of x from zero to infinity, dx. But hopefully the uh, the answer makes sense. Okay, so here's our partition function for the translational part of the uh, the particle in a box. And remember that uh, beta equals one over kt. And so we can write our partition function as x over capital lambda, where lambda is defined as uh, this collection of stuff. Notice the mass of the particle is in there. And it has dimensions of length. And if you check out the translational partition functions that are in your book, I really recommend doing the reading for, for, these, uh, for, for these topics definitely before coming to class on Monday. This, uh, it's particularly dense in the book in this chapter. There are a lot of examples. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's useful to look at them. Um, so this, this lambda is, is a quantity that's going to be important for translational partition functions in general. And one of the things that's in your book is an extension of it to three dimensions. And if you work all of these things out, you'll notice that it has dimensions of length. And it's related to the uh, de Broglie wavelength. And so what that means is the partition function increases with the length of the box and the mass of the particle, which should be consistent with your intuition about how this works. So you have your system with the particle in the box, and you know that it's, it's, it behaves more in a quantum-like way for much smaller particles and for smaller areas of confinement, whereas when you get to a longer one-dimensional box or a heavier particle, then it behaves more like the classical system, and the levels are closer together, looks more like a continuum. You get the same kind of answer for, the, uh, for doing this in terms of the partition function. So remember, getting a larger quantity for the partition function means that more levels are accessible to the system at a given temperature. So it looks more classical for heavier things and larger uh, boxes. OK, so that's one example of a translational partition function. It doesn't have to be for something like a particle in a box. You can do this for just particles moving around in a flask. Um, it's a little bit more boring for the classical systems because there's not much of a, you know, there's not much quantization going on. You know, almost all the levels are equally populated in that case. We can also do this for something that looks like vibrational spectroscopy. So we can write down a harmonic oscillator partition function. So here's our potential for a perfect harmonic oscillator. So our potential looks like a parabola. And then we have all of these uh, vibrational states, the uh, harmonic oscillator wave functions, which are Hermit polynomials. They're equally spaced. And the harmonic oscillator levels are also non-degenerate, just like the ones for the, for the particle in the box. And we know that the separation between the levels is, we can call it epsilon. We know that it's h nu. And we can define the lower energy one as being 0. So then the first excited state is epsilon. The second one is 2 epsilon, et cetera. And so we can start to write down an expression for the partition function of this thing. So we have our energies in terms of epsilon, the spacing between them. And we know they're all non-degenerate, so that takes care of, uh, of that term. And we can just start to add these things up, and we can observe that this uh, starts to look like an infinite series that we know uh, what it converges to.
And so we can use this expression as uh, the partition function for the, the harmonic oscillator. OK, so how do we know that? Again, this is the case where, you know, OK, you, you write down sort of how this is going and then use some approximations that you know or, you know, this isn't even an approximation if you have enough terms that the series converges to that. It's just, uh, you know, recognizing what the, uh, the math comes out as. And if you, get, uh, if you get way into StatMac, you get more experience doing these things for different systems. Okay, so we can play around with this a little more. and uh, look at what our infinite series converges to. And so we have our partition function for the harmonic oscillator. And we can use this to, to get uh, some relative populations. So the fraction of molecules in some particular level with energy epsilon sub i, again, we get this by um, taking the you know, taking e to the minus beta epsilon i over q, the, the partition function. And we can write out what this is. And again, we get uh, the pretty intuitive result that as we decrease the temperature, only the lowest energy state is occupied. And it's kind of nice to look at some of these systems where the states are all non-degenerate because that gives us a really good intuitive feel for you know, how things are just depending on the energy. Of course, when we get into things where there is degeneracy, that often wins. And so at high temperature, again, our partition function goes to infinity. In this case, you know, we have this parabola that's going up to infinity. There's an infinite number of vibrational states that are excited. Of course, in a real molecule, that's not a realistic approximation, right? Because in that case, we would have a Morse potential, where eventually, if you put in enough vibra vibrational energy, the molecule is going to vibrate itself apart. But in this idealized system, we have an infinite number of levels. And the populations are going to tend to be equal at high temperature. So, so far we've looked at uh, some examples for various systems that we're familiar with. Let's go back to um, a translational kind of problem and something that we've seen from general chemistry. Okay, so I've sort of alluded to this, but you know, here I've, uh, I've found some, some actual examples for it. All right, so we talked about the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of molecular speeds for noble gases, so for, for ideal gases. And at some given temperature, if we look at the, uh, the speed distribution of these, uh, these atoms, we see that uh, helium, the one that's the lightest, has a really broad distribution. There's all kinds of different speeds going on in there, and uh, it's relatively flat. Whereas xenon, the heaviest one, not only has a much lower average speed, but it has a lot narrower distribution of different velocities that it can have. And you know, when we think about that, that lambda parameter that has dimensions of wavelength, we can also get some relationships between that and the speeds of the molecules. So this goes back to the kinetic molecular theory of gases. And we can think about the effects of having heavier particles as being sort of analogous to taking the same particle and looking at it at different temperatures. So having heavier particles is, gonna, is going to, to look similar in terms of how it behaves as taking the same kind of gas and cooling it down. So we're going to save the 
actual uh, details of that for next time. I just wanted to, to introduce it, give people time to think about it. Um, later today, I will have some practice problems posted. And I will see you all on Monday. Have a good weekend.